Good evening. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to hear Edward Brathwaite, who comes to us from Barbados and Jamaica. And I want to thank our sponsors who helped to bring him here, and that includes the Department of Anthropology, of Foreign Languages, of History, Cross Disciplinary Studies, the Graduate College, and the Lecture Committee. And I also want to say that after the lecture, if you wish to meet Dr. Brethwaite or talk with him, there will be a reception at the Black Cultural Center, and that is, I believe, 517 Welch Avenue, is that right? Immediately after the presentation this evening. Dr. Brethwaite, I'm going to give make this very brief because I cannot possibly cover his many books and articles and so on. But he is a historian and a poet, and he got his doctorate at the University of Sussex. He's won several poetry prizes in London. He spent nine years in Ghana, and he is presently a professor at the University of the West Indies in Jamaica. He grew up in Barbados, and uh, some of his poetry directly describes Barbados and its geography and so on, and he's just come to us from Toronto and goes on tomorrow to Ohio, so I think we're very fortunate indeed to catch him and have him here. Edward, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I've been, I think it's about a year I've been trying to get here um, with one thing and another. But I've made it at last, and I'm really very nice to be in Iowa and at this campus, this university. Now, this evening, I'm going to read some of my work. I'm going to talk a little about it, but not as much as you might think. I have a feeling that I really want to read more than talk. But there are certain things which I ought to say which will help to give you a background to what I'm, what I'm going to try to do. The first thing is that in the Caribbean today, we are concerned with the question of identity, who we are, and that is artistically being expressed in the form of language and in the symbols that the language creates. Now, it's an old story in a way, what is, who is, who are you, um, who am I, and all that. But for the people of the Caribbean, it is a very real concern it is not that we have made it up. It's not that we, we feel we ought to get into some kind of argument. It is that we have inherited a large number of world cultures, and they have been inherited by us, gestated by us, ingested by us in a very strange way. The first people were the Amerindians. Um, they were the people who occupied this landscape, the landscape of the Caribbean and the landscape of the Americas, for that matter. And the Europeans displaced these people, and in displacing them, were forced to bring into the Caribbean two major sets of people, the African and the Asian. And although these people came, part of the condition of their coming, the condition of slavery and colonialism, was that they would forget what they carried with them. They would have to forget or pretend to forget or be made to forget the elements of their own culture. So that for many years, hundreds of years in fact, the people of the Caribbean pretended or behaved as if they were English, as if they had been the inheritors of King Alfred and his cakes, of Robin Hood and Sherwood Forest, and you know um, the kings and queens of England from Elizabeth I to the second. But despite this apparent acceptance, we retained our own culture, or our own cultures. There are Amerindians living in the Caribbean, as there are Native Americans living here. Um, the Africans transported and brought with them their culture in a remarkable degree, and we always behave in an African manner, 
despite the contradiction of also accepting and performing in an English European mode. And the Asian people also did the same thing. So that in the Caribbean today, we have Christianity with its Catholic and Protestant forms. We have African Shango and Kumina and Convince and Santeria. And we have the Asiatic Hindu, Muslim, and the various forms of their own culture. And it is at this stage now, when we have reached our independence, that we are beginning to re-express these various cultures. And we are having to do this all in a multi-ethnic, a multiracial, and a multilingual manner. We are, in fact, now at, in the enviable position, I would say, of creating something like a new language and a new form, using English as a base, but playing upon that base and counterpointing it with all the elements of the cultures which make up the Caribbean. And I express, I represent part of that experiment. My work is concerned in two areas. One, with the archaeology of the Caribbean, if you would call it that. In other words, I have to learn more about what we did not know. And that is where my history comes in. We have to begin to understand things which we had taken for granted. We have to understand family forms. We have to understand our own forms of economic resource, our own political thinking, our own theological ideas. That's the one hand. And on the other hand, we have to express that in a way which is representative of the Caribbean. So that I'm both historian and poet, very fortunately. Um, I need to be a historian in order to do the kind of work that I do in the creative arts. That's the real point. So there's no real contradiction. And I think that's enough as a start. Now, the technical aspects of the poetry will, in some measure, be revealed if I read well enough, if you listen carefully enough, if you don't fall asleep, if things go well. Um, I'm not going to give an analysis of the forms of the poetry this evening, because I think they will emerge in some way if I read the right kind of poems. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to start with with the pairs of poems, really, what I'm doing, I'm making slight contrast to show you um, one aspect of the subject and then often a slightly different aspect of the same thing. And I'm starting with the image of growing up in Barbados. Um, to give you an idea of what it was like to be a little boy faced with these contradictions that I spoke about, these historical and cultural contradictions, but not really being fully aware of them. And the little boy in this poem is diving for coins. The poem is called Dives or Divees, whichever you prefer. So the contradiction is present already. If you want to make it biblical, it becomes Divees. If it is Bajan, it will be Dives. And in each case, the goal is gold. That is the point of the poem. Um, the nature of the gold and its objective is problematical. But like divies, we, the divers, were searching for some kind of wealth. Um, our wealth was, as you will see in the poem, um, very, very marginal. It was not really the kind of wealth that we could build the island with. But as boys, we enjoyed the athleticism of diving for coins. And this is the point. Before they built the deep water harbor, sinking an, an island to do it, we used to row out in our boats to the white liners, great ocean-going floats to dive for coins. Women with bracelets, men with expensive tickers on their wrists, watched us through bland sunglasses so that their blue stares never blinked. They tossed us pennies. The spinning flat metallic bird would hit the water with a little flap and wing zigzagging down the water's track. Our underwater eyes would watch it like a cat as it dark bottomed sunwards like a pendulum 
winging from side to side, no black, no bright, no black, no bright, catching the dying daylight down the cold, dark tides of the ship. Every shadow we saw was a possible shark, but we followed that flat, dark light. Even if the propellers would suddenly turn, burning the water to murderous cold, we would never come nearer to gold. I heard certain reactions there from the audience. I think you share in some way that kind of experience. They're the tourists, as you know, come to our islands and they, they perform this action of, of asking or encouraging the little boys to dive for these coins. It is a sign of the relationship between one part of the world and another. Although, as I said in this poem, we were not really aware of what that relationship was expressing. But it leads to, it leads to other kinds of relationship and other kinds of reaction to it. And the next two poems express other forms of that relationship. When the little boy has now grown up or has been stunted in his growth, and this is the result. Through corneas of glass, I see my people black. I see them homeless, still and shiftless, slack and hungry, white-lipped, ray-mouthed, beggar at the corners, bugged, drugged crying out to the enemy for bread. They cannot worship their dead, their ancestors of centuries steps when they must beg, hand cupped, backs to the cold wind for shelter. Stick, wall, roof, stockade of books, when they must eat those books you offer them, pink proverbs, blue-eyed revelations. I see my sisters, Aretha's, Angela's, how they have burnt their hair so near to God, how they embalm their bread of breasts, how they forget the Sphinx, accept your Gentile Venus. I see my brothers high and nodding, shadow boxing to the tune of needles, angels of the fix, bartering their sanity for trips around the skeleton, I hear them screaming, revolution as the world revolves wrong Marcus, Malcolm, Mississippi, Memphis. But there ain't no vein of revolution, only the blues and Coltrane's gospel pain. <coughs> Propped against the crowded bar. He pours into the curved and silver horn his old and happy longing for a home. The dancers twist and turn. He leans and wishes he could burn his memories to ashes like some old notorious emperor of Rome. But no stars blazed across the sky when he was born. No wise men found his hovel. This crowded bar where dancers twist and turn holds all the fame and recognition he will ever earn on earth or heaven. He leans against the bar and pours his old and happy longing in the saxophone. So that's the, that is the picture, that is the scenario. The little boys who die for coins have come to that fix, have come to that fixed situation. And it is the responsibility now of these people to try to do something about it. They've got to change the world in one sense. They have to create a revolution, but they've also got to change their own manscape. They've also got to try to change their own sense of the world. And this is what these poems will be trying to do this evening. We have to begin, as I often have to begin, being a traveler, being a person who has had to travel many places, find many kinds of home. 
we have to begin really with a sense of home. And I myself, coming from the kind of situation which I have described, I did not really begin to get a sense of home until I lived in Ghana for those nine years. It is only towards the end of my time away from home, living in a culture which in a sense is my ancestral culture, that I began to get an idea of what home really meant, what community means, what it means to have a sense of linkage, what it means to have a sense of spirits, what it means to have a sense of living in a continuum where past and present and future are fused. That came to me after my experience in Ghana. And therefore, it was possible for me after that to begin to write poems about home, about Barbados, about the Caribbean. Because it's funny, although I lived there, I was born there, I did not know how to write about it. It was easier to write about something else. It was only after a long time, after a long journey, after a great effort, that one was able to recognize that there was a home where it should be. And I was able to write a suite of poems called Ancestors, which deal with my grandfather, my grandmother, my granduncle, and all the relatives, all those people who formed the extended family in my own home. And it's interesting that a lot of things happened having discovered that home. Um, one was that it is in the shop where my grandfather's brother, my great granduncle, um, did his work. And I celebrate in a poem called Ogun, in which I see for the first time his connection with Africa. It is many years after that, many years after that, in that same shop, now broken and shattered, he dead no longer used, but occupied by a group of people who I shall bring to your attention towards the end of the reading, that I, one evening, listening to them in their church, in their chapel, in their religious exaltation, realized for the first time that the language that they were speaking, although it was Barbadian English, it was also Igbo, that in fact, I was beginning to understand the reason why Barbados did not appear to have a culture. It wasn't really that we didn't have a culture or even that I was not perceptive enough to recognize a culture, but that the nature of the Barbadian culture was of a peculiar nature. It was not a, a dramatic culture like the Yoruba or the Dogon or the Dahomian. It was this quiet, acephalous culture of the Igbo where things are submerged and where one has to understand certain conventions before the secret, as it could be seen as, was revealed. But ancestors, poems in honor of my grandparents, my Barbadian ancestors. This is where we begin, with my grandfather and his contradictions. And then the contradiction is replied to by his wife, who has a much greater sense of the culture Every Friday morning, my grandfather left his farm of cane fields, chickens, cows, and rattled in his trap down to the harbor town to sell his meat. He was a butcher, six foot three and very neat, high collar, wing, the gray cravat, a waistcoat, watch chain just above the belt, Thin, narrow-bottomed trousers and the shoes his wife would polish every night. He drove the trap himself. Slap of the leather reins along the horse's back and he'd be off with a top-hearted Humburg on his head. Black, English, country, gentleman. Now he is dead. The meat shop burned, his property divided. A doctor bought the horse, his mad Alsatians killed it. The wooden trap was chipped and chopped by friends and neighbors and used to stop gap fences and for firewood. One yellow wheel was rolled across the former cowpen gate. Only his hat is left and I borrowed it. 
I used to try it on and hear the night wind man go battering through the canes, cocks waking up and thinking it was dawn throughout the clinking country night. Great caterpillar tractors clatter down the broken highway now. A diesel engine grunts where pigs once hunted garbage. A thin asthmatic cow shares the untrashed garage. All that I can remember of his wife, my father's mother, is that she sang us songs. Great Tom is cast was one that frightened me. And she would go chug chugging with a jar of milk until its white pap turned to yellow butter. And in a basket underneath the stairs, she kept the polish for grandfather's shoes. All that I have of her is voices laughing me out of fear because a crapo jumped and splashed the dark where I was huddled in the galvanized tin bath. Telling us stories round her fat white lamp. It was her Queen Victoria lamp, she said, although the stamp read, ever ready. And in the night, I listened to her singing in a Vicks and vapor rub like voice what you would call the blues. Come a look, come a look, see what happened. Mm? Come a look, come a look, see what happened. Suki dead, Suki dead, Suki dead, oh. Suki dead, Suki dead, Suki dead, oh. And then there is the, the little contradiction to that. That is a nice feeling of family. That is a feeling of home. But still, the little boy who dived as he grows up doesn't always recognize that homeland, doesn't always recognize and appreciate that sense of community. And here in another island, in the island of St. Lucia, in fact, um, a relative comes to meet him, a relative comes to visit him, and there is a sense of distance between them at that moment. Um, things still have not yet quite returned to the full circle as there is a toss night between us. High seas and then in the morning, sails slack, rope flapping the rigging, your schooner came in. On the deck, buttressed with mango boxes, chicken coops, crocus bag rices, I saw you. Older than I would wish you, more tattered than my pride could stand. You saw me, moving reluctant to the quayside, stiff as you knew me, too full of pride. But you had traveled, braved the big wave and the bilge swishing stomach, climbed the tall seas to come to me. Ship was too early, or was I too late? walking still slowly, too late or too early. Saw you suddenly turn, ropes quickly cast off the capstan, frilled sails were unfurled, water already between your hull and the harbor. Too late, too late or too early. Running now, one last rope stretched to the dockside, tripping over a chain chink in my armor, but the white Bows were turning, stern coming rung squat in the water, and I, older now, more torn and tattered than my pride could stand, stretch out my love to you across the water, but cannot reach your hand. Well, that contradiction, that experience, which is really common to us all, 
but which for us has a deeper meaning. It is part of that difference of perception between the imitation of the culture and the authenticity of the culture. That kind of experience has its historical base. And now for the second movement of the reading, I'm, I'd like to read you two ideas from our historical perception. The first is a Haitian understanding of it, in a way. Um, the poem is called Citadel, and it is inspired by a mural at Port-au-Prince done by the Haitian muralist Alexandre Wa. Now, this was on my first visit to Haiti, the Black Republic, a place which, again, we, we have never related with as we ought to have, we people of the Caribbean. Haiti has become marooned from the consciousness of the Caribbean, much to our own disaster, because Haiti, of all the slave plantations in the New World, Haiti is the only one that successfully revolted against the master, against Prospero, against the overlord, against the oppressor. And the, the manner in which the Haitians were able to overcome this remarkable form of oppression is still something that we don't really understand. How is it that a set of people who were unorganized, who had apparently no leadership, who according to the records had no culture, no resources, were able suddenly, apparently like a volcano overnight, to defeat Napoleon Bonaparte, the, to defeat the greatest power in Europe at the time. And not only to defeat Napoleon, but to create alternative structures to what Napoleon had posited as the good life. That is something that we don't really understand. And so when I went to Haiti, I didn't understand either the mural by Alexandre Waugh, um, which depicted for the first time for me a sense of history which was cyclical. What Wa was saying is in his mural was that the first people who lived here were the Amerindians, and out of the Amerindians come the Spaniards, and out of the Spaniards come the French, and out of the French come the Africans, and out of the Africans comes modern history. I found that remarkable because I would assume that he would want to divide these people, that he would want to perhaps put the emphasis on the victorious Haitian, perhaps. But I did not realize then that because of the victory of Haiti, because the consciousness of the Haitian had already been able to transfigure that original experience, that he was able to recognize that each of those movements was only a small part of the total history of that ancient country. And that was the first time that I began to get a sense, too, that history could bring us together not only divide us. And the poem Citadel is a poem in celebration of the great citadel that Christophe, Henri Christophe built in the north of Haiti. Uh, but he uses that symbol of Christophe's achievement to, to, uh, as a memorial for the achievement of all the peoples who made up that nation of Haiti. And in fact, what he does is to say that the Arawaks use that same citadel as their headquarters long before the Europeans came to the island. At the peak of La Cap, where the citadel sits, the Arawaks wait. The flesh of their headdress are bells up the mountain. The rings of the palm trees are bells up the mountain. Toussaint is a zemi. He stares from the flesh of the stone. The white of the helmet, Columbus conquistador. The white of the sword becomes lightning. The steel of the cutlass, the knife of the god. Thongs of the whips drink water like trees. Africans from the slave ships dance out of the rifleman's loins, become desolines. Desaline, la creta piero, the spangle of death from the hot of the trees. And Christophe Columbus climbs up to his mountain top with the face of his horse in the faith of his shadow. He stumbles on priest, on an ivory slave, on a Spaniard. 
The places of pain become pig snouts. The black becomes white, becomes black, becomes rain, falling to plunder the roof of the world. Toussaint is a zemi. He stares from the stone, from the eyelids of flame, at his fate. And then the other view of history, the Barbadian view in a sense, the, the view that I went to Haiti with, the view of the slave master on one side and the slave eroding, if possible, the prestige of that individual, that person, that representative. And this poem is called Conqueror. The images are taken on the one hand from English shires, from the world of the slave master. And he, in a sense, is looking back to his homeland. He is looking back to his homeland. He's wishing that he did not have to be an agent in the Caribbean. He's remembering his pubs and his reign and his women. And he's planning to send his children back home before they become Caribbean. And under it all is that persistent drum which he fears, which he does not understand, the drum which represents the alternative culture, the drum which is like a rat eating away at his composure. From quiet shires of church bells, falling leaves, to this salt turbulence, sand under my feet, pebbles, powdery hills, halting my innocence. From the wooden bridge, pub on the corner, its signs swinging, willows in winter. To this empty house, these windmills turning, turning, this midnight drummer. There was a king and his court, archbishops, churchmen. I had nothing to do with them. I obeyed the laws, poured my soft head of ale in the evening, fished in all weathers, hauled my revenge of pale women. Its signs swinging, swinging, willows in winter. Here, there is this empty house, these windmills turning, turning, this midnight drummer like a rat, like a rat, like a rat a tat tapping, like a rat, like a rat, like a rat a tat tapping, we eyes, we teeth, we eating, like a rat, like a rat, like a rat a tat tapping. Like a rat, like a rat, like a rat a tat tapping. And we burn in Babylon. Hail Selassie, hallelujah. Hail Selassie, hallelujah. It was a victory for the chapels blowing their Bibles. Black preachers speaking with the voices of conks as Toussaint did in Haiti, as Christophe died in Haiti. Speaking from the tongues of whips, tonnels, speaking from the lips of limping angels, Loa, as the gods do in Haiti, in liberated Haiti. It was a victory for prayers, starched linen, hallelujah, pressed pants, barefoot respectability, drought, no law, no land, the pastors almost doubted. You ask for bread and they hand you a stone. No loaf, no love, no miracle. You ask for a roof, ceremony of the monkted dead, and your spiked head rots by the roadside. Drought, no law, no land, the pastors almost routed. And then those eyes, 
that could speak so sweetly, burn so softly, farms by the seaside, green growing on green, green glowing against the blue. For now, I would obliterate you from the obscurity of yourselves and certain silver, from the faint hearts of your mindless architects, from the starless dampness of your leaking corners. I would obliterate you from your self-cement of fist, of rise of rocket, from the hatred of your color, from the inhabited dungles of no hope. I would take you into the home of the brick, the flat foot of the mortar, the spinning industrial space of the spider, the hoofors of favela vision. I would ask you to walk the four corners of your understanding, rum, cock's blood, spirit, liberation, humbly to step from slave to certain owner, humbly to acknowledge mother, father, brother, sister, humbly to break forth song, psalm, hand clap, petal from the dungeons of unrighteousness into light, into stone, into pathway, into leaf of hope, and the rope, whip, tomb, boulder that has bound you, now talisman, now twisted into prayer, now shredded into timeless stairs like a rat, like a rat, like a rat a tat tapping, like a rat, like a rat, like a rat a tat tapping, and be burning. Burning, 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 burning. Now, the consequences of that history, the consequences of it, the consequences both of the sense of reconciliation and the sense of opposition. The first consequence is that, in fact, the sense of reconciliation remains a metaphor, that as we proceed into the real world, the reconciliation does not, in fact, take place. There is always another crisis. There is always another economic spiral. There is always another riot somewhere, or an invasion somewhere, or a coup, or a collapse, which upsets the whole sense of cosmos, which upsets that effort that one makes to see things in some sense of equilibrium. In other words, we begin to recognize that it is a long journey and a tremendous effort that has to be made, that reconciliation is a word which is very easy. The sense of compassion is something which we can use in English literature. It is a very fine notion, but that the everyday bucking up of person to person, of culture to culture, of group to group, still has its contradictions and still creates a frisson, which although creative is also very cruel. We have this in Barbados. We dramatize it every year. In fact, it was also dramatized on American television a few nights ago. Um, cricket, of all things, the game of the Caribbean. Um, the origin of baseball, perhaps. We don't know quite. It is an English game played by 11 people on each side, two in the middle who bat, and 11 who surround them and try to get them out. And you Americans always say with a sense of wonder, and it takes five days to do it. <laughs> That is part of the culture, the leisurely culture of that man who thought of his pub and who remembered the windmills and the, the signs on the pubs creaking. It's a leisurely world. But we have introduced into it our own sense of drama, our own sense of language, and our own sense of meaning. For us, cricket is not just a game between two people, two sets of people. 
cricket often as a test match is a confrontation between England, the oppressor, the slave master, and our own people. It is the occasion when we can dramatize the ability of Caliban to defeat Prospero, or at least we try or hope that Caliban will succeed in defeating Prospero. If we were not able to do it in history, we would be able to do it on the cricket field. And so this poem illustrates, in a way, this sense of drama, this sense of conflict, which we have between the two. And because it is a dramatic poem, for the first time this evening, you hear the language of the islands, which is English, but English converted, subverted, whatever you want to call it, by the other cultures. <coughs> this poem begins in a, in a tailor's shop. Tailors, barbers, hairdressers are our hungans. They are the people who are the centers of our community. People gather in a tailor's shop not to encourage the tailor to do his work, but to listen to the tailor's sense of history, to listen to the tailor's sense of politics, to listen to the tailor's nomo, his power of the word. Same thing with the barber, same thing with the hairdresser. Um, this is, to a large degree, now being sub subverted by the sung system and the disco, where you can't really listen to the word as you used to, but you still listen to something which is underneath the word, and that is the rhythm and the beat. Because basically, the word itself is an aspect of rhythm. And here, the tailor is talking not about his work, although from time to time he remembers his work, but about a cricket match that he was captain of, he was in charge of, on the beach. Because our cricket begins in Barbados on the beach, not on the hallowed fields of Eton and Oxford or Kensington Oval. That comes later, but we begin on the beach. Um, using a soft ball and a coconut branch and two, three sticks, um, we learn our craft there. And the tailor had his team, which um, was doing its own thing. But as he thought of his team, he slowly began to think of the m more serious business of the, of the West Indian team, of the Barbadian team, and its confrontation with Prospero, the English team. So he moves from one to the other. Many a time I have seen him saving the side the tailor was saying as he sat and sewed in his shop. You remember that tourney with Brandon? What he named now, that big able water policeman, the one in charge of the harbor patrol. You mean hop along, Cass? <laughs> it's because a cow give his mother a kick before he did born that his foot come out so. Yes, I know, but that is not what I'm talking about. Old Hoppy was bowling that day as if he was hurricane father. Lambert went in, plain he knowing all about it as usual, and swoosh, there he go fanning outside the off stump, and his click, he snicked the ball straight into the slips. Well, boys, it looks like we lost in this match, says the skipper, writing not in the exercise book he was keeping the score in. You think we could chance it and send Gullstone in before Charlie or Spooks? So Gullstone went in. You could see his face whitening under his tan, and you know that that Saga boy frightened. Back tapping, feet walking about like they're talking with ants. Had was to stop myself asking myself if he ever played cricket on Bronx Beach before. And I told him, I told him over and over again, watch the ball, man. Watch the ball like it hooked to your eye when your first goes in and you don't know the pitch. I don't mean to poke, but you just got to watch what you're doing. This isn't the time for playing the fool and making no sport. This is cricket. But Gullstone too deaf. Mother don't clean out the wax in the air. First ball from Cass and he fishing. Second ball and he missing, swishing the bat like he wishing to catch butterfly, though the old Gullstone could ever catch when this beach was a coal. But it's always the trouble with we. We too frayed and too frightened. It's all very well when it's rosy and sweet, but lemmer the start and boogalung gung, you can't find a man to hold up the side. Look what happened last week at the Oval. 
at the Oval? What happened last week at the Oval? You mean to say that you come in here with that lime skin scone you're calling a hat on your head and your slip slop shoe strap on on your foot like a tourist? You sprawl your ass all over my chair without asking me please leave no license. Wasting my time when you know very well I can't find enough to finish these zoot suits before Christmas. And on top of all this, you can wind up the nerve to stop me cool, cool, cool in the middle of all my needle and thread. Make me prick my hand in my haste and tell me broad and bold to my face that you don't know what happened at Kensington Oval. We was only playing the MCC man. MCC, who come all the way out from England. We was batting, you see. Score wasn't too bad. 197 for three. <laughs> the opener's out. Ty Worrell out. Everton Weeks just glide two for 50. And Jack is the giant to come. A fella named Wardle was bowling, tossing it up sweet, sweet, slow, medium syrup. First ball, no, back down the wicket to Wardle. Second ball, no, back down the wicket to Wardle. Third ball coming up, and we know what going to happen to Syrup. Clyde back on the back foot, and Prax is through extra cover, and four red runs all the way. You see that shot, the fellas were shouting. Jesus Christ, man, want to see that shot? All over the ground, fellas shaking hands with each other, as if it was they wheeling the willow, as if it was them had the power. One man ran out upon the field with a red foul cock going quack, quack, quack in his hand, and would have given it to Clyde right then and right there if a police didn't stop him. And in front of where he was sitting, one ball headed skeptic snatched hat off his head as if he did crazy, and pointing his finger at Wardle, he jumped up and down like a sun shattered daisy and ball out, Blood, big boy, bling me he blood. Who would have think that for 25 years he was standing up there in them post office cages licking glory and the government stamps? If I wasn't there to see for myself, I would have never believed it. I would have never believed it. But I say it once and I say it again. When things going good, you can't touch me. But lemur to start, an old man, you can't find a man to hold up his side. And then the dread situation, where it is no longer a question of laughter, but a different kind of dramatization. The ghettos, the dungles of Kingston, Jamaica, where the culture of poverty becomes so acute, the pressures of living become so dread that the reggae, the ska, the rock steady, those songs which you, which you appreciate, those songs which you relate to, um, are not simply songs that you can sing, but also the songs that express the oppression are symbols, in fact, kinds of bombs being thrown from one part of the society into another. And the song system is a kind of explosive device. And this poem, Starvation, is a poem which is the meditation of one of the dread sufferers as he waits by the bus stop and he wonders about the things I've spoken about. Why is it that history has apparently passed him by? Why is it that history has these strange contradictions? Why is it that poverty remains the prerogative, it would seem, of a certain group of people? This is no white man land, and yet we have ghetto here. We have place where man can live good. We have place where man have to sweat shit. We have place where man die with my water dry up, where he can't even cry tribulation, where the dry rubber rocks clog him in. I did swim into this world from I was a small boy and I never see harbor yet. Ship can't spot no pilot light. I burning through this wall of silence with my dread. Look how I look and little fun. Herb, sung system, 
running aground with the dun drum and blues. Some in deny a binger, but none of them come. The earth coal, you see me here. The good year tired them tech flight of dust and nasty water from the pothole from the asphalt. And land pant up the sufferer them standing by on the sidewalk. Inside the wayside cabin them a call a bus stop advertising Sheraton Hotel. You see this root of bottle, spring blade rising from the shacks. You see this tall vexation pan my face that never favored talk that want to strangle priest and politician, that want to halt the brothers in black space, the daughters in them dream of Abyssinia, the white black Trenton in them cage of Barbican, a Red Hills, a Skyline Drive, a Babylon. This rage a crow them, walking pan the coffin with its wheels, stopping at the station, police station, hack skin for Sergeant Brown, when the little picnic them drunk in a dry gully and the hungry belly making one with my skull, with my white cock of debt, with my fuse buck of health, with my leaking drum. Like a them pass with the ras, box, taxi cab, limousine, I waiting here. One day the grass going green. The tire them going shred to to the rim. The Sheraton Hotel going flash out all it light. It money making room going resurrect themselves back down to gravel. And Babylon going here and crash down to the ground. With I and I still here. With I and I still standing here. With these blues. With these bogle blues. With these broken. Buckle blues. And then a blues. I woke up this morning, sun shining, shining through my door. I woke up this morning, sun shining, showing through my door. Cause the blues has got me, and I ain't got strength to go no more. I woke up this morning, clothes still scattered across the floor. I woke up this morning, clothes still scattered across the floor. Last night the ride was lovely, but she ain't coming back for more. Sea Island sunshine, where are you hiding now? Sea Island sunshine, where are you hiding now? Could a swear I left you in the cupboard, but his only empties mocking at me in there now. Empty bottles knocking, laugh like a woman satisfied. Empty bottles knocking, laugh like a woman satisfied. She full and left me empty laughing when I should have cried. This place is empty bottles. This place is a woman satisfied. This place is empty bottles. This place is a woman satisfied. She drink my sugar water till my sunshine died. I woke up this morning. Sunshine ain't showing underneath my door. I woke up this morning, sunshine ain't showing underneath my door. She gone and left me empty, and I should have died. Mm -hmm. And then we have the, the more aggressive picture coming out of this situation. You can have the blues, you can have the meditation of the dread, but you could also have the Rastafarian himself, Brother Man, the man who has made a decision to create a culture for himself, who is no longer prepared to wait, who is no longer prepared to perform through the politics of reconciliation, who is prepared 
to make a new world for himself and using the symbols of the culture of poverty to do that. Now this poem has an interesting history in that it came at a time when we in the Caribbean were debating whether it was possible to use what I call nation language. In other words, it was when the debate was on whether dialect, as it's called normally, um, could be used as a vehicle for poetry. Believe it or not, that was a serious matter for discussion. And it was at one of these convocations, one of these coll colloquium, 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 um, that this poem was first read. And in a sense, the reading of it settled the argument about whether we could use our nation language. Because it was all very well for the argument that dialect does not carry meaning, dialect does not have the power of the English language and all that. But it was only when the dialect was actually demonstrated that I think the argument came to an end. And the poem that I read that day was This Wings of a Dove about the Rasta man. The features of the poem are not only the images of Rastafari, but the use, certain use of drum rhythms, which are an essential aspect of, of that culture. Brother man, the Rasta man, beard full of lichen, brain full of lice, Watch the mice come up through the floorboards of his downtown shantytown kitchen and smiled. Blessed are the poor in health, he mumbled, that they should inherit this wealth. Blessed are the meek-hearted, he grumbled, for theirs is this stealth. Brother man, the Rasta man, Hair full of lichen, head hot as ice. Watch the mice walk into his poor hole, reached for his piece and the pipe of his ganja, and smiled how the mice eyes, hot pumice pieces, glowed into his room like ruby, like rhinestone, and suddenly startled like diamond. And I, Rastafari, in Babylon's boom town, crazed by the moon and the peace of this chalice, I, prophet and singer, scourge of the gutter, guardian trench town, the dungle and young's town, rise and walk through the now silent streets of affliction, hawk's eyes hard with fear, with affection, and hear my people cry, my people shout, down, down, white man, con man, brown man, down, down, full man, frowning fat man, that white black man that lives in the town. Rise, rise, locks man, Solomon wise man, rise, 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 let me laugh them, mock them, stop them, Kill them and go back, back to the black man land, back, back to Africa. Them don't mean it, you know. Them can't help it. But them clean face brungs in Babylon town is who I most fear and who fears most I. Watch the vulture them a flying. Hear the crow of them crow. See what them money a buy. Caw, 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 caw. Old crow, old crow, cruel old old crow. That's all them got to show. Crow fly, flip flop, hip hop on the ground. Now feet feel firm on the firm stones. Now good picnic born from the flesh of them bones. No, 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 no. So beat them, drums them, spread them, wings them. Watch them, fly them, soar them, hide them, clear in the glory of the Lord. Watch them, ship them, come to town them, full of silk them, full of food them, and them plain them, come to ground them, full of flash them, full of cash them, silk them, food them, shoe them, wine them, that them, drink them, and consume them, praising the glory of the Lord. 
so beat them, burn them, learn them, got them, got them, nothing but them bright, bright baubles that will burst them, when they flame them from on high them, raise and roar them, and deplore them, rise and rage them in the glory of the Lord. Now, a few poems about the resolution to that conflict. As I said, not really a resolution because as I quoted here from Jimmy Baldwin, the whole idea of resolution is not something that comes very easily. And those of you who remember, um, tell me how long the train's been gone. There was a passage there which means so much to me because of what we are trying to do. He says, it was as though after indescribable, nearly mortal conflict, after grim years of fasting and prayer, after the loss of all he had, and after having been promised by the Almighty that he had been paid, that he had paid the price and no more would be demanded of his soul, which, would ha which was harbored now. It was as though in the midst of his joyful feasting and dancing, crowned and robed, a messenger arrived to tell him that a great error had been made and that it was all to be done again. That is, I think, the situation that one is very conscious of as we in the Caribbean, having moved from a sense of colonial dependency to political independence, have now found ourselves once more in a strange period of economic and all kinds of new dependency. The culture of poverty which I spoke about, which has its creative moments, is also something that appears to be slowly strangling the society. The society itself, in its effort to express itself in its own way, to create a sense of worth, has also found itself practically bankrupt, so that many of us are now in debt to the IMF and in debt to various other international bankers. And the violence, which at first was expressed mainly as reggae, mainly as sung system, is now becoming endemic. And it begins to look as if we are going to be at civil war with our own brothers. In other words, the culture of poverty has not only started to create its own worldview and its own cosmos, but is actively challenging those who are of its own flesh and blood. And a strange implosion seems to be about to take place. But as I said, these are the penalties. These are, the, these are what one earns from trying to be oneself. And I think that we have to go through that particular kind of middle passage also before we come out to the other end, so that it is not as easy as it at first seems. But one has great faith. One has faith not only that the language will provide a symbol for the experience, but one also has faith that a culture which has survived for so long under remarkably oppressive circumstances, a culture which has been submerged for so long, um, will eventually continue to emerge in a way which will make sense, not only of ourselves and to ourselves, but make sense to ourselves in relation to the, to the other people in the world. And so these last poems, which represent a kind of resolution within myself, although as I said, the contradictions remain, and a whole new series of works have to take place. But first, a quiet poem called Sun Song, which celebrates the drought, the drought which visits the Caribbean every year, coming from the Hamatan, coming from the shores of West Africa, coming from the Sahara, once more linking our past with our present. Um, that drought is our most beautiful time of year, when it's dry, when the flowers flare out from the otherwise empty branches. It is a, a uh, it is a spring and autumn, I suppose, is the only way that I could describe it in your own terms. 
It is a time when our spirits, our spirits, the spirits of ourselves walk abroad, and when the spirits of the land meet us under those trees. And this poem is a poem about that. The drought has dried my tropic, my mellow suns, my fat banana green. Termites' wings visit me, spindles of tamarind leaves falling through yellow light. a different ball game that we begin to move somewhere forward. And the person in this poem who suggests the alternative, who suggests a different kind of game, a different kind of seeing, a different kind of relating, is the same old lady who cleaned my grandfather's shoes at the very beginning of the reading. It is that culture, that aspect of the culture, which now begins to return to a central position and the technical aspect of this poem is that O'Grady, representing the ego, representing Europe, representing what I call the missile, speaks with an I sound. His, his key word is I. That's the sound that he makes. And he really wants um, the, the other person, the, the person who is resisting him, to use I rather than me, to use I, that vowel, rather than the the deeper sound of m, m, ma, me, those sounds. So it's, the poem is really based on a counterpoint between the m sound of the mud, of the mother, and the i, the high sound of the whip of the slave master. That is, what the, that is, how, that is the kind of development that is involved here. And at one point in the poem, um, for the first time in my own experience of writing poetry, I actually started to glimpse the possibilities of a new language. In other words, a language which is in fact the twilight zone between English and our own nation language. And it, it comes in a passage there when the, the oppressed, the Caliban, I better call him, is at his, he is almost at the end of his resistance when he calls upon these final resources of his nomo, of his mother. The poem, of course, goes back earlier than what I'm going to read. It's all about how Prospero worships in church to charge himself with a kind of electricity for this, for this debate, for this confrontation. Um, and the people who watch him reckon that he must be buying archangels, swords, and a burning bush like when Adam get pitched out to even. But then they are also ready to confront Prospero. And so the game, the debate, the reality begins. And it begins with the sound of the M's, the mother. But ma, 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 my mother, mud, black, fat, soft, Manure, cuckoo, cooking pot herb, wallaba wood, evening time smoke, sleep, sleep, rest, ma, ma, me mother, mud, don't like what she see, she don't like he. She don't like he at all, she don't like he. She is wah, wah, wash, she is watchy. She is spit right into he all seeing eye that she draw with she foot on the ground. And she spiting and spiting. She spiting and spitting, she curses upon him with the sharkest tootishy tongue. The man who possesses us all, who break the heart of she husband hand, who wreck the land of my father, 
Don't possess me at all, she is Telma. Idi go, I go die, I go dead, she is Telma. I go day, I go dog, I go die, she is Telma. Ma, 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 she is Telma. Ma, ma, man, she is Telma. Say man, she is Telma. Say man, she is Telma. Say man, say man ding, say man dingo. But O'Grady says, say I, say I, not me, not man, not mother. I, say I, O'Grady says, say I, not E-Y-E, -E, globe, seeing word, blue priest, green voodoo doctor. Say I am your world, you must not break it. Quick, O'Grady says, say stick, say dog, say sick, say good, say God. Say wick, O'Grady says, say whip, say I, O'Grady says, say I, say I, say I. But me more, me more, mud, me mother, break the word, she eat it like cheese, like curled milk, like yellow bread. And she tea and she teach and she teach me that the world rising in the yeast with red, with cloud, with morning mist, with the iron of birds. But look, O'Grady says, look, lock, O'Grady says, lock, bar, bolt, rip it and throw away the prison. Say lock, O'Grady says, say key, O'Grady says. Ki kai kai sky, O'Grady says, and darken your derision. Say I, O'Grady says. Say I, say I, say ice, O'Grady says. Not cool, O'Grady says. Say kill, not keel, O'Grady says. Say ship, say whip, not sheep, O'Grady says. Say kill, sails, future rock, plantations greening. Say scream, O'Grady says. I cannot dream, O'Grady says. Say hit, say hot, say pot. Say rot, O'Grady says. Say rat. Say right, say white, say wrong, say strong, O'Grady says, not song. Say trip, say trap, say sit, O'Grady says. Say pain, say blame, say cane, O'Grady says. Say name, O'Grady says, not me, not ma, not mother. Drain, O'Grady says. Say name, O'Grady says. Say run, O'Grady says. Say shame, O'Grady says. Say sun, say flame, say bramble. I come, O'Grady says, to strangle you maim in the ground. But ma, ma, my mother, cool like she cool like she cook. And she come here to me from the ground like she lick me. Like she lick me with grease, like she grease me. She come to me years like the yes off a leaf and she is. She come to me years and she purr like a puss and she esper. She whisper to me that me name, what me name, that me name is me main and am is me own and lion I main. That winner men take you and am, them is nominate different and nam. So mandingo, she yesper, you nam. And he nominate, 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 and he nominate, nominate, nominate. Lay me black, lay me blue, lay me poo pa pa do, lay me nig, lay me nog, lay me boo ba ba loo. But he never know what me mean. And he nominate, 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 and he nominate, nominate, nominate. But he never mean what me mother me name. And he never nyam what me mean, cause back to back, belly to belly, a done give a damn and a done dead already. Back to back, belly to belly, done done dead in the ground.
If you say stand up, then if you stand, you're out. You know the game, because I think all children play. Now, in this poem, it is no longer a game, as you can imagine, um, because the cultures have